Welcome to another Eric Waite Live. I haven't been doing live shows as much as I had in the past. Uh, there's a whole lot of reasons why, but I'm really, really, really excited about tonight. Um, if you're in the chat, let me know what you're drinking. Hopefully, you're drinking something from uh, Teeling. If you're catching this on the replay, uh, make a comment down below. And I'm really, really looking forward. So what we're doing tonight is uh, sort of a behind the scenes. I got a special guest on. We're going to do sort of a virtual tour through the distillery. But I have never had a rep on my show, and that's been intentional. Um, I've had master distillers on. I've had distillery managers on. I um, and we've already and we've discussed this uh, about a week ago. I um, don't want to turn ever want to turn my channel into an infomercial, right? Or I've seen some of my fellow whiskey tubers. They bring someone on, and there isn't any dialogue. There isn't any not real interaction. You not you don't have the ability to ability to ask questions. So the chat's doing its thing, and the rep is just going blah 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 for an hour, and you can't really get in a word in edgewise and like that. I do not want to do that. I'm not turning this into an infomercial. No matter how much, I, even if it was Ardbeg or any other one, some, you know, my favorite distilleries, you know, even if you know, some of the distilleries in Texas and stuff, and I'm falling in love with and more and more in love with Teeling, this is a virtual tour, a relaxed interaction between two whiskey geeks, one who just so happens to work for and represent Teeling Distillery. And when we kind of really hit it off. Uh, we were introduced, by the way, uh, by a gentleman by the name of Eli, one of my neighbors here who owns a whiskey shop down the road. And that's where I picked up, actually. And this is not a paid advertisement. That's where I picked this uh, Teeling pot still. Probably out of the core range, my favorite pot still. So I poured myself a little bit tonight. All right. So thus far we're in the house, we have Donner Pass Whiskey, who lives not too far from me. Uh, Santa Cruz, down there in Santa Cruz, uh, and it's been a while. I haven't seen you in a while. So let me bring on my guest, and he's going to introduce himself, because if I introduce him, I will mispronounce his name. <laughs> How you doing, Frank? I'm doing good, Eric. So uh, my full name is Pane Frantoshek Correo Yakupka. So everybody calls me Big Frank, or Frank Yakupka is what you could say. There you go. There you go. So, um, so uh, Frank lives in Livermore, which is where uh, my aunt and uncle and my cousins uh, lived. My uncle was on the fire department there, so we're not too far apart. Uh, so, if you're not familiar with Livermore, Livermore is in the East Bay, uh, and there's a whole wine country there. It's where I went to college and studied enology. There, I interned with a couple of different uh, wineries there. I know we're not going to talk about wine, but you have a wine. One, there's a bunch of different things that we have in common. Our birthdays are only a couple of months apart. Born in 1966. Uh, we both got the beards going on. Uh, Looking good. <laughs> we both look like we're not underfed. <laughs> so talk a, just a little bit about the wine background, which, and then how you got into whiskey. So uh, I started, I went up to college uh, in Sonoma, and then I started in the winery. So uh, uh, in 1988 was my first crush. Uh, I've worked at places like Hacienda, Deloach, Fieldstone, Louis Martini, Cundi, uh, along the way. And then uh, I switched and we went into retail for a little bit. And when the dot-com hit and crashed, so did we. I went to work at uh, uh, Virginia Gallo teaching wine knowledge, uh, management and sales. And that's where I got this. Uh, I love Gina, but the, the other part was tough. And then Remy uh, Quantro came calling one day, and I've already been passionate about spirits. And I'm like, I'm all in. So I spent 14 years there working on brands like McAllen and Highland Park, uh, famous grouse in 1738, things like that. And then the Teeling boys called and said, Frank, there's a job at Teeling. Are you interested? And I said, yeah. And they go, you're hired. I said, what's the job? They go, we don't know. We just went to work for it. So it was the best interview I've ever had in my entire life. Nice. Uh, I've always... You got a little bit of echo. I've always dreamt of, of wanting to work either full-time in the wine industry or the whiskey industry. Uh, it, but for the most part, it's just been sort of a side passion and hobby uh, for me. And do a little bit of work here and there, but you know, not, nothing I can actually uh, live off of. So one of the things I really like about Teeling, and I don't, you know, you're not supposed to talk bad about the neighbors and like that, but Teeling, some distilleries in Ireland can be a little bit old school, nice whiskeys. But I've noticed the, the the percentage of distilleries that are doing everything at 40 ABV, still using the E150, still doing the chill filtering and all that. 
Um, not, plenty of you know Scottish distilleries and the, particularly the, the the blends that do it as well. But you see a lot more Scottish whiskeys uh, of the 46 and above and cast strength is teeling. This is one thing I like about teeling is the, at least the core range or at least all 46 yep. percent. No, uh, no, no, no added coloring and the really nice quality uh, whiskeys there. So eventually we're going to do a, a virtual tour for everybody who's tuning in. So um, what? So, it, so I did a, a video on the history of teeling for those who didn't see those. Basically, you had Cooley Distillery uh, in the in mid-1980s, which then sort of resurrected Kilbegan Distillery, and then that got sold to Beam Suntory. I'm giving the short story. Yep. And then that sort of uh, gave birth to that. They then started Teeling Distil Distillery uh, in Dublin, correct? In Dublin, yep. In Dublin. In the, in the eight. Pardon? In Dublin eight. So that's like right. our zip code is uh, in Dublin eight. Okay. So that gave birth to Teeling Distillery. So the two sons of John Distillery um, then started this distillery. And it seems to be a, it's that next generation that starts a, maybe a little bit more. We're going to respect history and, and, and do some things that are a nod to history, but also do things new and, uh, uh, and, and a little bit more mainstream and, and modern. And I think the tour of the distillery is going to show that as well. So we did that sort of a good sort of idea of where Taylor, uh, Taylor is at. Yeah, I think that's a great one. And the really what we are is, you know, we want to pay respect to the past and how things are done and all that. But at the same time, we want to innovate and, you know, we don't have to just be conventional. We can be unconventional as we go about things. And you guys will see it in the way that we do some things like in uh, wet milling or other things that we go through, uh, just the, the way we go about barrels and, uh, you know, putting whiskey into a bourbon barrel and not just finishing it there because we then move it like on our flagship into a rum cast. Well, every time you move a whiskey, you lose about 2%. Right. So right. You fill a bourbon barrel, lose 2%. Empty it, lose 2%. Fill the rum cast, lose 2 Empty it, lose 2 We're already an 8% loss, even with the angel share on top of it. So if you know, some bean counter gets that, they're like, well, wait a minute. We could save how much and sell it? But no, we, you know, we know the only way that we can win is on flavor. Right. right. And the, the casting is really unique. The casting is really, really unique. Um, is that it's not just bourbon and sherry, but a number of different wine casts. In fact, if I recall correctly, and I'll bring one up here real quick. Um, so it was uh, the casking. Oh, on the single grain, on the yep. on the single grain. So there's there's three fortified. You have a sherry, a port, and a Madeira, and then there's a burgundy cask, and then there is the don't tell me don't tell. Oh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Can, can yeah, we that's the single malt. The single grain oh. is the Napa Valley Cabernet. So oh, it spends its whole life, all six years of its life, in a European French oak uh, Napa Valley Cab, and that's the one that has the five barrels to it. Okay, so, so this is the one. This is the, this is the single malt is the one that has five barrels. Yes. Okay. Yes. So stand corrected. Now there was there was something in my video when I reviewed this that I was like, say what? Um, and then you and I discussed it uh, off camera, so I thought we'd talk about that a little bit again, because I thought it was strange that they had these big, you know, heavy fortified wines, and then on the on sort of bookends, uh, and then you had this Cabernet Sauvignon, which is very tannic, and then this, you know, white Burgundy, which is a, a Chardonnay. I was like, okay, how is a Chardonnay going to compete with these big notes on this wine? I was like scratching my head, and I, I think. Uh, and you so you explain what what the Chardonnay does, and then I'll give sort of my two cents on that. Yeah. So when you have you know five different barrel types going into this single malt, you know you're going to get different flavors, whether it's ruby red fruits or uh, or nuttiness and all those things. Well, you want to have a balanced palate from the front to the back and a nose. And what we found is the white Burgundy gives you this beautiful nose right off the bat. So when you stick your nose in the glass, you know there's the white Burgundy coming in. And then those other flavors take over after that. So we get from the front to the back of the palate, building the whole way through. And it just makes for an absolutely delicious uh, way of making a whiskey. So um, um, one of the, it, dawned, it dawned on me later during our conversation, and, and I should have known better, because a Cote uh, is like 95% you know, Syrah. 
And they use just a little bit of Viognier, which is a white wine, as a Chardonnay is or white Burgundy is. And that little bit of a white gives it a lift. It gives sort of an aromatic lift. So it seems to me that that's the role. It's not that you're going to big punch of Chardonnay flavors, but that it sort of gives it this lift of all the heavy fortified, you know, big tannic red wine. And then it gives it sort of an aromatic and maybe a lighter fruit lift that sort of lifts the whole thing. And so that's sort of the role in that is that is the way it sort of lifts the rest of those uh, and in the blend and how that comes together. And that makes a lot more sense to me now. Yeah. And it's like a little pinch of salt in a dish will open it up. Right. Or a little bit of acid. Like, you know, I love to put vinegar on my rice because it right. just makes the rice taste so much better. That's what's happening here is that uh, white burgundy. It's not a ton that goes into it, just lifts it up and gives you those beautiful flavors. And I wish I, knew that before I did my video, but you know, it, it's, I, I know, I don't know everything. I'm always studying, always learning. It's a never ending. Me too. Process. You know, if I lived to, you know, you know, if I lived to be the age of Yoda, you know, I'd, you know, <laughs> I'd still be learning, still learning. And it, it's, it's, and it's great when meeting someone like you and having these conversations is you can get that behind the scenes information, you know, the in, whether you're talking to a master blender, a master distiller, someone who's been in the trade as long as you have, and has an insider knowledge, which I really, really uh, enjoyed. Uh, I'm talking to you off screen and now bringing you back on. So really, really. Just from the last time of talking to you uh, when we were talking off screen and uh, you said, oh, I was drinking Balconing. And I said, oh, done. I, I went that day and I bought a bottle of blue. You know, I just had to go get Ooh. one just to, for the heck of it, you know, to try it again because you put it in my mind. So I'm like, oh, you know, the last thing I want is a house palate. I want to taste right. everything in the world so I know what's going on with our uh, with our whiskey. So blue, I'm not going to get off talking about. So blue is was the first um, Texas whiskey that was made in like 50 years. It's not my favorite of Balcones. I like the single malts and all the way. So if you, it, well, I'm not going to get to talk about Balcones, but I'm glad you mentioned that because one of the things, and I, I don't want to, you know, reps are working that they got to earn a paycheck. You know, they got to they get they have to make the boss happy. Boss doesn't want you talking about other distilleries or whatever else. But oftentimes, when you ask a rep, hey, you know, when you're not drinking whatever brand you're representing, what are you drinking? And they get the sweat pouring down. They go, oh, crud. They ask me that question. <laughs> you know, oh, I like to drink beer, you know, okay, you know, or, da, 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 da. but I really like the fact that if someone, because you're a whiskey lover first, wine lover before that, and you yeah. just have to be working for a really great distillery, and that's just added to everything else you're drinking. And like you said, you don't want to, a house nose, oh, well, we, uh, just, uh, um, a barrel house oh. nose, or whatever you call it, to where you can't smell, really smell anymore because you become so uh, just focused on your own. You really need to have a, and as I think, a perspective as well. If you're, if you're in the United States making American whiskeys, you need to be tasting Scotch and Irish, you know, as yeah. to what are they doing outside of the world. And if you're over in Ireland, Scotland, you got to go. Okay, what are the Yanks doing, and what do they taste, and become familiar with on the other side of the world. Because the Bordeaux producers here, they're drinking, uh, you know, um, I mean, the, the Cabernet producers here are drinking Bordeaux, and Bordeaux drinkers are tasting a Napa Valley, you know, those Americans. All the time. Are, all yeah. the time. And particularly Burgundy, you know, the Burgundy lovers, the Cabernet, the uh, uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay lovers are always drinking from the other side. <clears throat> so I really appreciate that, that it's um, not in terms of being honesty, is, you know, nobody drinks just who it is they're working for. I, and even I, the, the distillers, Master distillers, as oh, they first they're probably, with, they're probably, probably the worst at, at drinking everything because they want to, they always want to learn, you know, they want to see what other people are doing and learn. And like Alex Chasco is our master distiller and he comes from the beer industry. So he worked at Pyramid and um, at Bridgeport. And Bridgeport is the originator of the West Coast IPA. So what it taught him was that beer didn't have to just be that lager style that we got used to from the big houses. You could do anything. And so now with his mindset of whiskey is I can do anything. You know, he has a hundred different barrel types in the warehouse and seven different geniuses of wood. And, he, you know, we tasted one together one day and I'm like, that's the worst thing I've ever tasted. He goes, but if I didn't fill the barrel, you would never know. So you got to fill the barrel to find out. Right. I think we're also in a really exciting time in terms of Irish whiskey. I have to admit, you know, I was when I first started getting into whiskey a few years ago, you know, I had these little these little minis, and you know, I tasted a couple. You know, your your large brand, mass produced brands. I was like, meh, meh. Mm. You know, fell in love with Scotland, 
And I only got into doing this whiskey merit, this Irish whiskey marathon, uh, because it was a box I had to check. Like, sure. you, you know, you, you're not into, uh, you know, basket underwater basket waving, but you have to take the class, in, you know, for in college. So you take the class, <laughs> or what, or, or some sort of class, yeah. college, you know, required. So, and then once I got started, here we are, you know, I'm going on, we're going to be going into four months doing Irish whiskeys. I really, really fall in love with Ireland. And then from a historical perspective, um, really, wow, this is an awesome time to be getting into Irish whiskey. Uh, oh, yeah. Now, there's some challenge in terms of distribution and all the nonsense that's going on now. But it's really exciting to see what's going on now. Distilleries popping up. There's now last count, I think it was like 33 distilleries. Short time ago, there was one, two, three, four. One and a half. Yeah. 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 Literally. It was Middleton and Bushmills. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Bushmills, it was experimental stills two days a week. So, yeah, one right. and a half distillery. Right. Right. So, it's an exciting time beginning to whiskey. And I want to highly, 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 highly recommend if someone's, you know, just, you, you maybe had one Irish whiskey, you, you know, St. Patrick's Day, the obligatory Irish whiskey you know, on St. Patrick's Day. And you really haven't given Irish whiskey a second thought. I want to highly, highly, highly recommend checking out Teeling Distillery. My favorites uh, is this is this is the single malt and uh, uh, the single pot still, the single pot still. And okay. I think I lean a little bit more on the single pot still, only because it's more unique to Ireland. Um, it's it's Irish Irish only. It can only be made in Ireland. Uh, you know, it's, you it's like champagne. You know, it's, it has that pedigree to it. Right. Right. So um, let's see. So um, I'm trying to think. So currently there is, uh, we have these single grains, single malt, single pot still, and the, sm and the small batch. So, yeah. the so the small batches are flagship. That's what we make the most of. Uh, that's what we're most proud about, you guys. So this is age first for five years in ex-bourbon. And this is about three to one uh, grain whiskey, the uh, malted whiskey. Right. And right. then uh, it is finished for two years in rum casks. Right. And the right. reason we went with rum casks is Alex Chasco, he'll always tell you, uh, you always know when he's nervous, he's holding a clipboard in front of him, you know, and he's talking in front of this group of Irish whiskey uh, aficionados, you know, down in the basement of this hotel and says, what do you guys taste? And on this one, they go, oh, it's a port finish. And this one, it's a Madeira. And when they got to this, they're like, we don't know, but we like it. And he's like, aha, I got it. And because uh, he was trying all these different styles of whiskey and what to do with them. And so that's how we ended up with the rum finish. Uh, right, with right. This. And uh, most of it's uh, Nicaraguan cast that we get them from. And uh, we bring every barrel over whole. And that's you really unique because uh, most, you know, uh, houses will break the barrels down, shrink wrap them, uh, put 2000 in a container and ship them over. Well, we can get about 100 in a container. And we ask them to leave six liters of product in it. So by the time it gets to us, there's one to two because that keeps it moist and from breaking right. down. Right. But, you know, uh, we want those flavors that the barrels have. So when you break them down, they dry up. But we don't want that. We want all that flavor. The Napa Valley Cabernet is, a, you know, is a great one. With the color of the whiskey, um, you can see it being that red tone in there. That's not the right. color of whiskey, you know, and that's because of those wine barrels. Um, so, so this really, is, is shipping, and a barrel manager can correct me, but if you're shipping a wet cask with that much whiskey in it, the alcohol should be a good protectant of the cask as well, so you're not exactly. having to dose it with a heavy amount of sulfur. Uh, right. It's it's kind of rare to run into a a whiskey that has excess sulfur sulfur in it, but you do run into them. I know of a couple in the Highlands uh, that that are like that. So it has two advantages: more flavor. And less sulfur and that kind of a thing that you're gonna have to add into the cask, and so yep. and, and so you're getting a, a wet cask, and that kind of makes sense because um, and I keep them straight in my head. I think it was it was a yeah it was a single malt. There seems to be a there's a in fact all, all these really there's a sort of a freshness and vibrancy and a juiciness to these whiskeys uh, that I really really a, a, enjoy as well, and that's probably come from the wet cask. So if this one it, you get some dried. Black fruit, like raisins, but you get this sort of tropical notes that I think are yeah. classic, uh, the yeah. classic uh, rum notes. And, you know, and this is a whiskey that we want you to drink it neat. You know, that's our hero pour. 
But, you know, make old fashions, make, you know, tiki drinks out of it. Those tropical drinks are absolutely gorgeous with them. And I like to do a Saturn with passion fruit and orgeat to it. Oh, it's just absolutely delicious. Of course, Irish coffee is a great one. And then I make what I call black sauce. And that is a reduction. I do equal parts, two cups Guinness, two cups brown sugar, and two cups St. Germain elderflower liqueur, two cinnamon sticks and four cloves to balance it and reduce it down to a syrup. You Put go. it in there your you Irish go. coffee. You're going to go, where's that fat guy? I got to kiss him. They're so delicious. Your friends go crazy. Over <laughs> and, that, and that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and this is, and in terms of and quality price ratio, uh, someone uh, mentioned in the comment, they got it for 23. I think I paid like around 25. Um, it's a very, of course, it varies from state to state and taxes and all that kind of a thing. But it's still very, very, very affordable and high quality whiskey. Really, really. Yeah. So quality. I'd say, you know, depending on where you're at, it's probably $33.99, $34.99 every day. California, there's price wars everywhere. And that's one of the things that happen. People sell them for right. and hardly anything over. You know, California, you'll find it most of the time $29.99 okay. around that price point. But for quality, the price ratio, you know, I'm thrilled to drink 10 of these bottles compared to one, you know, you know, bottle that, you know, it's going to sit on my shelf. Because to right. me, Let's drink a bottle. I have over 500 bottles in my collection at home. Nothing's off limits. And you come on over. If you want to drink 64 Highland Park, drink it. Because otherwise, it's a trophy. I want to say, Eric, remember the night we had that? I want the memory of it. That's what matters to me. That's the most important thing. So one of the most surprising whiskeys, I don't have a huge, ex ex lot of experience with uh, grain whiskeys. I've only, I've so I have a Hedonism, which is a blended grain. And then I have another one that, that, that's a uh, single grain. So I've tasted them without reviewing them, but this is this was the third grain whiskey I had. And this one, you know, I call this the for me, and this is just my experience, I called this the, the thinker's whiskey. And I don't know exactly why, but it seemed like every time I went back to it, I was drinking a different whiskey. Oh yeah. And, and so, so a lot of most whiskey, generally speaking, and there's exceptions, but generally speaking, I get a whiskey and it might be a little bit muted when I first open it, and then it opens up, just like open up a a bottle of wine gets and it opens up a little bit, a little bit more, but you're getting more of what you've already had. More uh, uh, this, it was almost like I was going back to a completely different whiskey. The evolution on this whiskey and the ride that went on, I really, really liked. And it was sort of I, I, on the back end, I was getting like these like mocha chaka character. And because I've had, I've drinking uh, uh, over the last twenty years, a few thousand Cabernet, yeah. you know, Bordeaux, and, and a lot of Napa. I, I had that sort of sense of memory that I could really see the connection. And there was even a sensory experience, a, just a slight dryness, slight, a slight tannic note. Uh, and I don't know if it would tannin or from, from the cab, but I was getting a little bit of that as well. And I really, really liked the, liked the single grain. Yeah. And, you know, and most green whiskeys, they're, they're pretty rare to find out in the world today. There's not a whole lot of them being made. You know, they're off the comb still, which we love. And they, um, with this, you know, when you put it into that uh, Napa Valley Cabernet, into that French oak barrel, it really builds the complexities. And th this is one of the oiliest whiskeys of the world. So if any of you guys have it, you take a little bit, pour it in your hand, and then rub your hands together, and it feels like lotion. And it's that oily. And that's where you keep getting those flavors coming through, Eric, is as it changes, it keeps going. And Everybody at the winery, they know exactly what I'm going to say right now. My favorite way to drink this is neat with the beer back. I absolutely love it. I take a sip of whiskey, sip of beer, sip of whiskey, sip of beer. And my wife says, how many drinks have you had today? I say four, right? Because a whiskey and a beer counts as one, not two. So it's not eight <laughs> drinks. It's only four. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and it's a great way to drink this. So this is not... We don't make shot in a beer kind of whiskey. Right, we make right. sip that whiskey, sip the beer, you know, is to cleanse that palate and have some fun with it. Right, right, right. So um, we're about 25 minutes in. Um, so everybody who's watching, uh, we're going to do a uh, behind the scenes virtual tour. Let's all pray to the God of technology that everything works. Because <laughs> as you know, live streams, it can always be a challenge. Something could go potentially go a little bit uh, goofy. So we're going to do a virtual tour and talk a little bit as we do a virtual tour. You know, I was actually hoping to go to Ireland this year, but due to the COVID and all this nonsense, I wasn't able to go. But it, it's actually, in one respect, been an advantage because I would have gone over there not knowing my ass from a hologram. 
Whereas now I'm having all this experience with whiskey with all these distilleries. And then when I go over there, I'm getting so I'm getting kind of hyped to go. I'm a little hyper, yeah. just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit. But now I know exactly what I'm getting into and what I want to visit. <clears throat> but since I mean it's expensive to try, even if you don't have COVID not cred, it's expensive. It, you know, people have families to get on a plane. It's from here, it's 10 half, 11 hours. 11 hours. And then you got jet, jet. So you, I think you have been to the distillery, yes? Oh, yeah. Yes, many times. Then there's the jet lag, uh, which I get a little goofier when I got, j- got jet lag. Uh, so, so, you know, my, my secret on jet lag is when you get off the plane, whatever time it is in, in that country, that's the time that your day is. So when we go over to Ireland, we usually, uh, I usually go in a day early being from California. So I get there about 1140 in the morning on Aer Lingus. I get off, I go right to a pub, I get a little fish and chips, I eat some lunch. And then, you know, then I'll go to bed at a normal time. And that really helps make a difference. So uh, Donna Pass says, I'm just going to bring this one up to comment on this. He says, um, I understand they had a deal when they sold their distillery to get cask. How many years until the spirit from the new distillery is in the bottle? It's, it's, in, uh, it's in the single pot and it's in a uh, small batch. Yeah, in the small batch. Because that was the first release uh, from, the new, from the new distillery, right? So the small batch was first released, but it was still old barrels. Okay. So when when the uh, when uh, when John Teeling sold to Beam, we were able to get a couple, you know, thousand barrels. Well, tens of thousands of barrels came with us, and and those are ours. So that's how we have that old stock. Okay. You know, the okay. Teeling 24, uh, 23 years in bourbon barrels, uh, three years in um, or twenty one years in bourbon barrels, three years in Sautern cast. So we brought that with us, you know, and that's how we have those old stocks. So what would be, then it be the new stock? So new stocks going into the small batch right now, okay. uh, still blend with some old stuff, but the single pot is a hundred percent Dublin whiskey. It's all, it's okay. all a new out of the, yes, that's this all from okay. the new distillery. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. 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 So Donna, cause you know where Donna passes, that's where the Donna party, you know, had, yeah. had a barbecue uh, a long time ago. So you know, so Donner Pass is sort of a a, a neighbor. We've met up once, uh, and once this COVID creds over, I'll have to have him over again uh, to drink more whiskeys. So all right, uh, so we're about a half an hour in, and so are you ready to go with the virtual tour? Yeah, you tell me. I just uh, pulling it up right now. Tell me if you can see it. Uh, yeah, I can see it, and I will add it to the stream. And now I will take us out, so it's just uh, the camera. Or just this, there we go, just the distillery. All right. So you guys, so the first thing I want you guys to do to get your mindset that you're in Ireland is I want you to right now just take a deep breath in and think of that first rain of the year that we get like here in California and how great the earth smells and those smells that come up. Well, that's what Ireland smells like every single day. And uh, we're here in New Market Square. And this is where all the leather, all the silks, all the grains and everything would come into in the 16, 1700s. And oh, by the way, that blue sky, it's never blue in Ireland. They must have either photoshopped it in or shot this on the one day that it was sunny outside. Um, So down the road down here, about 500 kilometers where uh, the Tailing original distillery from the 1700s was. And then when the fall of Irish whiskey fell, so did we. But, you know, uh, the boys, when they came here to Dublin, they could have, you know, gone anywhere. They could have gone out into the countryside where it would be so much cheaper. But they wanted to bring distilling back to Dublin. And this was a really depressed area uh, with, in the middle of a great recession there in Ireland. And by doing that, buildings have started to go. And you can see this boutique hotel right next to us uh, opening up. So this is our distillery. And uh, Miss George that uh, designed it wanted to have the barrel feel like you can feel the door and the windows. Uh, there's a pagoda up top uh, that's classic for a distillery. You, when you see that, you know it's a distillery. But the Teeling logo is the phoenix uh, coming out of a pot still. And the reason for that is, you know, Jack and Stephen wanted to say, hey, we're bringing distilling back to Dublin. So we're coming from the ashes. We're bringing it, you know, back up, and that's why they decided to go with that instead of a family crest. 
so they could really you know honor uh, Dublin as a whole uh, with it right there. And you're going to see these black barrels throughout the distillery today. You'll find them all throughout Ireland uh, or Dublin uh, for sure. And there's a map on top. So if you're with your mates, you know, on a tour there and you get, you know, you lose each other, just follow that map back to the distillery. And this could be your safe place where you can always know you can find each other. There you go. <laughs> so let's head on in. When you come on in, uh, the in all you'll see throughout the whole distillery, we use all our old barrels. Jack and Steven don't like to waste anything. So, you know, we use them for the walls. Over here, there's a cafe. Now, you know, why would you put a cafe in a distillery? Well, this was a, you know, a depressed area of Dublin and there wasn't cafes. There wasn't a place for the locals to come. So during the week, you'll see grandma's having a pot of tea or the mom's club here, you know, having coffee, enjoying, you know, uh, so come in and get a pastry and all that as we go through. Uh, so once you check in, we're going to head over here into what we kind of like to call the, the history museum. And, uh, and there's one of the black barrels again. So again, our small batch is the spirit of Dublin. And we were gonna go with something with the Phoenix, but the, the locals said, no, you guys are the spirit of Dublin. You know, you're bringing it back. Because the last time uh, whiskey was made in Dublin, Ireland was 1976. And uh, so almost, think about almost 50 years, uh, whiskey had been gone from Dublin. And could you imagine going to Kentucky for 50 years and no whiskey was made there? I mean, that would, you know, that would just be a shame. Uh, as it goes. So over here is the the triangle. This is called the Golden Triangle. And uh, and this is where 34 distilleries were in the city of Dublin making whiskey. And Dublin was the epicenter of whiskey for the world. And then a few things happened. First, Father Matthews uh, started a prohibition against whiskey. He said, uh, a pint of whiskey is like a, uh, is the devil compared to a pint of beer. Uh, so uh, Ireland went from a whiskey drinking company to a beer drinking country. And then um, uh, this gentleman, a taxman with the last name of Coffee, invented the coffee still or the column still. And the Irish said, no, we triple the still in pots. The Scots said, hey, if we can go 24-7, we'll do it. And they adopted it and started laying you know, oceans of whiskey down. And then you had uh, Ireland fighting for their independence, and they won. So they lost 50% of their trade channels. And then the final nail in the coffer was prohibition. And that was uh, a Catholic thing. So the Irish said, no, we won't ship our whiskey over there. The Scots said, we'll do it. And uh, the old Irish bottles, the empty ones, because Irish whiskey was the best whiskey in the world at the time, uh, they started filling with moonshine. And it, it, everyone said, no, oh, it's gone downhill. So it went from 204 distilleries to one and a half in one person's lifetime. Wow. <clears throat> Yeah, think about it. Isn't that crazy? So, so <laughs> I don't know if I'm getting um, it or not. Um, with all that, it, it makes me more appreciative. You know, I, I you know, I, I've heard the stories of, of you know the Great Depression from my grandparents, my father growing up in the you know in the Depression in the First and Second World War, and all the stuff they go through, and we take for granted how good, as, and we can complain about COVID or whatever else. But we take for granted how good things are now and things that we have available. Okay. You know, we can complain, oh, gee, they only have these, you know, uh, five, four bottles here in the United States. Why can't we get some of the other ones? Um, there was a time in which, you know, they were down to one distillery uh, and you wouldn't have any of this. No, I mean, you wouldn't have had any Irish whiskey at all if it wasn't for the farmers. So uh, when it all started going to, you know, to, uh, to a handbasket there, uh, the farmers went to the government and said, hey, wait a minute, you know, the, the distilleries are going, who are we going to sell our grain to? So the government went to Jameson and Rowan Co. and Powers and Patty and said, you guys are all going to move to Middleton, the Irish distillers, and all distill from one place. Right. So right. Bushmills was there. All the rest of them were there. And could you imagine, you know, you spent a century being competitors and now you've got to work together. And so that saved the Irish uh, whiskey industry there. And then John Teeling, he went to Harvard Business School, got his doctorate in Irish whiskey, the rise, the fall, and how to rise it again, came back to Ireland in 87 uh, and uh, bought Cooley and then Kilbegan. And, but Cooley is right on the border of Northern Ireland and Ireland. And everyone's like, you're nuts. You know, you know they're going to blow you up. And they're like, he's like, nope. You know, he got it for a nickel on the dollar and then turned it into a great success. 
And then Bean came calling, and then the boys said, hey, you know, we, we want to do it. But Dublin was the second walled city, the second great city. And you can see, you know, the picture of the wall over here on our left. So when uh, you have this walled city, the Golden Triangle uh, was called the Liberties. And because you were at liberty to do whatever you wanted. So that's where beer making, whiskey, the tanneries, uh, you know, the illicit illegal you know, businesses were all out there. Uh, there were no laws. So, um, but when you brought your barrels in, the Irish were the first to play with barrel finishes. So they would bring the barrels on Madeira or Port, and when the tavern owner had emptied them, they would just throw them over the wall. And, and barrels for two millennia were the cardboard box of today. And so the Irish were the first to jump on them and say, hey, this, you know, this really works. And then we have the great Dublin fire, uh, whiskey fire. So a mill house caught on fire next to a rick house, and then they had uh, an ocean, a tsunami of whiskey going down the street, and 12 people died, sadly. Uh, they didn't die from the fire. They actually died from alcohol poisoning because they took their <laughs> boots off, filled them up, and started drinking. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so you're not allowed to <laughs> age. <laughs> yeah. So you're not allowed to age whiskey in Dublin, Ireland. Only a few small barrels. That's it. You're not allowed to have a bunch in there. Um, and this is something that I like. So it's kind of a fun bet. Does anybody know why there's an E in the Irish whiskey? Let's see if we can get it. see if we get anybody in the chat. Does anybody know why there's an E in Irish whiskey? Well, my, my story is it's because the Scottish wanted to save money because if you don't put in an E, you can save some money by not using as much ink. That's, my theory. <laughs> That's That was always one of my favorite stories to tell, too, to get a laugh. But what it is is like when the French came out with the AOC, the Irish said, That's a great thing because Dublin was making the best whiskey in the world. So they said, We're going to put an E in our whiskey so everyone knows it's from Dublin. And in fact, this uh, bottle right here to the side is from Belfast, but it says Dublin whiskey with an E in it. Um, I wish I could get closer so you could see the label, but I can't. I'm sorry. So they put the E in there just to say that. So now if you want to win a bet in a bar, uh, you know, go to the bar, take a look at your whiskey. And uh, like a um, maker's mark is the Samuelson family or Dickel. They're Scots, so they have a Y. Or, you know, Buffalo Trace, they're Irish uh, heritage, so they have the EY. So you can pick your heritage of where your bourbon comes from by how they spell it. So, you know, fun little goofy trivia, but it's always a good time. So you mentioned, and it might have flown by, you said the French had their AOC. Me, yeah. You and I are from the wine world. They don't know what that is. The oh. AOC is the, in English, it would be the Appalachian Original Controlly, or, you know, the designated place of where the wine is from. So by having, you know, saint Emilion or, uh, you know, uh, or, oh, yeah. uh, or, you know, any of the, <coughs> those are all AOCs uh, that designate a particular area where the wine's coming from. So by not having an E, it designates that this whiskey came from a particular place, namely it's close, closely associated with Dublin. So that's, uh, I, had to, I had to translate wine for these guys. Gotcha. <laughs> So here is our founders, Jack and Stephen. And Stephen's here on the left, Jack on the right. You know, they're young guys. And, uh, and when their dad sold the business, you know, they could have walked away from whiskey. And they said, no, 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 we love this. You know, th they have a passion for this. They, they wanted to bring it back and bring it back to the fullest that they possibly could. And so that's why they opened here in Dublin. And they really are unconventional in the way they go about doing things. You know, they're open to all kinds of ideas. 30% of all our production is experimental. So, you know, you think about it, they're putting a lot of it. Most places it's five or 10% max. 30% for us is experimental so we can learn and get better and better at making whiskey. So there's a couple of things I want to kind of point out. So Donner points out, he says, it sounds like the heaven, you know, you we were talking about the fires earlier. It sounds like the Heaven Hill fire in the mid 1990s, uh, actually yeah. 1996. Uh, amazing video footage on YouTube. And then um, Ben says, the way the bourbon community distillers came together after the 96 fire was amazing. Is there something, and it's, it seems quite universal. I see in Texas, we say historically in um, Kentucky, 
and I think we're seeing right, we're seeing in, in Ireland is that in the midst of tragedy, even though you're sort of competitors. Uh, they'll come together because you know either all die together or you all survive together. And everybody yeah. pitches in and about the neighbor. And that's, you know, the, the, before John Teeling bought Kilbagan, the local community had raised it back halfway up as a museum. And then John Teeling got it functional as an actual distillery. But yeah, that community uh, atmosphere in around the whiskey communities, and it carries over into the whiskey uh, tuber world as well. It's something I really, really beyond you know the beverage itself is the kind of communities that revolve around uh, whiskey. Yeah. And I so agree with you right there, Eric. And it is truly that way. You know, it's a um, it's a family when it comes to it. Our master distiller, Alex Chasco, is famous. You know, people call him the master of wood because he experiments with all these different barrels. And um, you know, houses come to us and say, "Hey, what do we do?" And we work with them. We tell them. You know, come taste this, see what this is about. You know, this works or it doesn't work. You know, we're always ready to help because if we make our whiskey better and they make their whiskey better, the whole industry rises with us. And, you know, there's nothing better than that than having great product on the shelf. All right, let's get on to the next, next spot. Next up. You got it. Fun little chair over here as we got going. It's, um, again, we don't want to waste anything. So you come in, take a picture right there. So now when you're at the distillery, you uh, come in while you're waiting. There's a video that you can watch when you're here. And then um, and then we come over here and then we're going to go into the distillery itself. So right now, you know, outside it was that beautiful, you know, fresh, rainy smell. When you step through this door, it's hot. It's muggy. It's super loud. And because we wanted you to see truly what's going on. So we didn't block anything off on the bottom or the top. You're going to see everything, you know, that we do and how it works with us. So, you know, when you walk in, there's going to be a, a bunch of different smells and flavors going on uh, throughout the whole place. So our silos are outside filled with our grain. And then as we come in, uh, we will come into our our mill and that's what we have right here. Oops, sorry about that, you guys, a little dizzy. Uh, so this is our mill and you don't normally see mills inside of distilleries because remember that fire, you know, when you mill something, there's this fine powder that comes off of it that's highly flammable. And so the reason we can get away with having a mill inside our distillery is we wet mill. So when it comes off, it's more of a porridge than just a powder as it comes off and uh, as it goes. So kind of the way to think and the reason why you mill it is um, the grains themselves, uh, you can see here, this is um, on the left is un, uh, unmalted, on the right is malted uh, barley. And uh, unmalted barley, uh, it's like a pebble, it's rock hard. Malted barley, you put it in your fingers and you can crush it and it, turns into this real powdery kind of a substance behind it. So you need to break them both up to make the single pot. Because if you put in, think about like a French press. If you put hot water with a whole coffee bean, you get coffee flavored water. But if you uh, grind it up in your coffee grinder, then you get this rich cup of water. And then we take it over here to the louder ton and, and drop it on in there, add the hot water to it and start building our wort. Uh, down inside here where uh, we take the temperature of the water and we're going to extract the most amount of sugars that we can uh, for us. And we're going to come along again with our black barrels. And when we ferment, we do it in two different types of tanks. So first we have these beech nut um, uh, tanks uh, here. They're actually Oregon pine, which is suiting because our master distiller is from Oregon. And we use two different yeast strains which is also a little bit different. Irish, I would say Irish whiskey and Scottish whiskey, the, what's the greatest way to kind of tell them apart? Scottish whiskey is very cereal flavor forward. Irish whiskey is very fruit flavored forward. And it's because of the amount of rains and the winds and that kind of thing that we get. So, so we use a South African white wine yeast for our first fermentation part. And that gets us to about three alcohol as we're going along. Okay. And, right. um, so if you... If you pan to the left just a little bit. Now, if you look, yeah, look at the louder ton. So 
and I, and I don't think Frank can confirm confirm this, but it's my theory the louder tongue was invented by ancient alien astronauts. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at it, it looks like a flying saucer, but that's just my theory. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. That's uh, I'm I'm gonna start using that in my presentation because yeah, yeah. who can prove me wrong, right? I wish if you're up in Orkney and you're looking at the Standing Stones, which uh, ancient alien astronauts on on the History Channel t is, says they're you know planted there by uh, uh, ancient alien astronauts. Anyway, all right, yeah. back to seriousness, back to the. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So we ferment away in this, and this gives us an extra depth of flavor. This this brings in this you know uniquely tealing quality that nobody else can match. After we finish it here, then we bring it into the back stainless steel tanks. We add distiller's yeast. We get our alcohols up to 8 to 10% alcohol, where we want to finally be. And then we head over here to the stills. And um, when we're over here, we have uh, Allison, Natalie, and Rebecca. And these stills are named after Jack Teeling's daughter, uh, daughters. And uh, we have a wash and two spirit stills. And let's see if we can get down deep in here. So I got a quick here. Daughter's asking. They call it Orchid and it's still or uh, but is it Douglas fir? That's what uh, they forest commercially in Oregon. Yeah. So they say it's Douglas fir is what they're calling it. It's Oregon pine is what they're actually what we have. Um, and then uh, and then here's our stills. Now normally you'd have a floor coming across right here, so all this would be covered up, and you'd only see the top part of the still. But we're really proud of our stills. We love the shape of the stills. We love what they do. So we wanted everyone to see everything. So we want to be transparent. We want you to know how we're making our whiskey, what we're doing with our whiskeys, and how they go about it. So we wanted you to see everything as they come along, as they go. And uh, it's kind of a good one there. Does anybody know why we call it a spirit? We have beer, wine, and spirit. Why isn't it beer, wine, and alcohol? That would be more appropriate. Anybody know the why? Mm -hmm. All right, I did the two. All right, so we call it spirit because Aristotle, he um, he said when you put the body, so we distill one of two things, right? Either beer or wine. So potato vodka, potato wine. We, that's the body. They put it into the still. And at 174 degrees, alcohol starts to vaporize, water at 212. And if you open the door of the still and look through the windows there, you'll see this ghostly kind of fog rising. And Aristotle said that's the spirit leaving the body, hence why we call it spirit. There you go. So stupid trivia for you. My wife says I'm the Cliff Clavin of the booze business, but it's always kind of fun to have something in your back pocket. As you all know, uh, all everything distilled comes out clear, and this is the liquor safe as we have it here for you guys. And we do double distill, and we do triple. The majority of what we do is triple distilling, but we do do a few things at double distilling. Um, it, it is not law that Irish has to be triple distilled. It's just uh, folklore that all Irish whiskey is triple distilled. There we um, go. We're going to head over to what we like to say is the barrel room for you guys because we can't really be in a bit, you know, have the Rick houses here. We age all our whiskey on the Cooley Peninsula in a place called Green Ore um, uh, is where all our whiskeys are at. But uh, we're going to head up here so you kind of get a feel of it a little bit. And uh, some of the different like this is a port pipe over here. You have bourbon barrels, wine barrels uh, to show you. But this is I kind of like this wall right here. Uh, and this is on the left, that's new make, that's white dog, that's poutine in Irish. That is, you know, right off the still, just put into the barrel. You see it's full, no color. We add no E150A. We don't add any preservatives whatsoever to our whiskeys. The second one over is Irish whiskey, three years in a day. And so the Irish, uh, think about it like you're copying your friend's homework, right? So after prohibition, when the Americans put the bourbon rules in place, the Scots said, that's great. We should have something like that too. And they wrote them out and the Irish said, oh, that's awesome. We should do the same thing. And so they made theirs. It has to age for three years in a day where Scots are three years. There you go. So the Scots say that it has to age in oak barrels. And the Irish said, oh, that's great. We'll do the same thing. 
has to age in barrels similar to oak. So that's how we can get away with using chestnut and acacia and uh, all these different Brazilian hardwoods and all that is because we have that opening. And other, because of that here in Ireland right now, other places like Scotland are changing their laws so they can start doing other barrels too. So right off the still, three years in a day, this is small batch for you guys here. So this is about seven years old. You can see how the color has changed. You know, the angel share has come out of it. And this is Teeling 24 uh, over here to the side where you can see how much darker it is, how much is coming out of the barrel itself. Uh, so it's a great kind of visual. So what, that is before so expensive. Yes, I said, but in 10 to 24 years, you've only got about a third of the cast left, if that. Yeah. So the course tells you how much it's going to cost. And then people want to complain how much it costs. Well, look how much you got left. Yeah, when you you got a third of what you started with, it you know it goes pretty you know pretty quickly right down there. Now I was telling you before, you know you're not allowed to age barrels, but this is our barrel room. So uh, Jack Teeling, uh, he had three daughters when they were building the distillery, so he named the stills after his daughter. Where daughters, where Stephen hadn't had any kids yet, and he does now. So now they have their own uh, single pot whiskey barrels. So I think if I was one of those kids, I'd rather have my own whiskey barrel and have the best 18 year birthday party ever in Ireland, uh, you know, that have those. So these are live barrels in here. It's all temperature controlled and, and safe. And that's how we're able to keep them there uh, for us. Now we're going to go into the tasting room upstairs. So when you're there, we ask you to leave your mark. So you'll see back here, uh, everyone just comes up and starts writing on the walls of the distillery. And uh, we want you to have fun and post what you're thinking and all that kind of stuff and be there with it uh, as it goes. And then we're going to head down to the Bang Bang Bar. There we go. Sounds like a place where we have to So the Bang Bang Bar, you guys, is open. You don't have to take the tour. You can just go right upstairs, sit at the Bang Bang Bar. You'll find a lot of locals sitting there after work coming up for our, you know one of our famous Irish coffees or some of the older SKUs or uniquely you know Dublin only SKUs like Brabazon or the Revival uh, as it goes through. But Bang Bang, it's called that because this gentleman after World War I, uh, he would you know hop on and off the trolley or when he'd come in and out of accounts, he would act like he was shooting guns saying bang, 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 bang. And uh, he was a real uh, colorful character and he lived right behind where the distillery is today. Um, so as you come in, we can you know, have some fun. You can sit at the bar and you can get a lot of these great older expressions of whiskey uh, or different bottlings that you can only find at the distillery uh, themselves. Uh, like right now, what it says they got the 24, 30 and 33 year old single malts uh, up on the shelf that you guys can try. And the 24 won the number one single malt in the world uh, two years ago. And we're really proud. That's the first time an Irish whiskey has ever done it. So, so when I went to, I've been over to Scotland twice and visited 40 distilleries. And so um, my second trip, I brought an extra thing of luggage and it's like a tank with these huge wheels on it. <laughs> so I could bring, bring some of them back. But did you say there was some place close or something like that where you can actually go to and they'll ship it home for you? The Irish whiskey shop in in Dublin uh, ships around the world. Okay, cool. Okay. So you can go online and buy whiskey from them and have them shipped over here, you know, for you, um, you know, for you guys and those kinds of things. Now, you know, anybody that's on this, if you want to go on a tour, you just get a hold of Eric. Uh, he'll give you my number, my email, and you guys call me up. We'll set you up with a tour of the distillery. Uh, like one of the fun things you can do is you can bottle your own uh, uh, bottle. So you can do a revival, you can do whatever barrel. So these are single barrels that they take out of the warehouse. When it's empty, they move on to the next one. And if I set you up on a tour, which we will for sure, uh, you have to bring me something better than a crappy t-shirt. Cause like Eric said, I like to eat. So it's hard to find a three X. So uh, you got to find something fun for me when you're in Dublin. As I, get home. <laughs> yeah. You got to have some fun, right? This world is way too short not to have a great time. It would, I would love to go over there and, you know, and, you know, give an announcement and have a meetup. And, you know, because uh, I'm meeting a lot of people through the on the Irish side of the whiskey world uh, through, um, you know, uh, 
uh, whis- Irish whiskey fans of America, you know, there's like 6,000 people in there. I would be, it would be totally, totally awesome to have a meetup with people who met me through YouTube and then meet up over there in, in Ireland and do a tour. That would, that would be awesome. Yeah. I'd go to the Boar's Head, you know, it's from 1185. The bar is, you know, it's, uh, it's the oldest bar in Dublin. Uh, one of my favorite things they do is go to the oldest bar in every city or every country I go to. And, uh, and that's the second oldest bar I've ever been to, uh, you know, 1185. So it's pretty cool that way. Should we uh, uh, close this down and move uh, back over? And there we go. All right. And we're back. There we go. Do you happen to have a light in front of you rather than behind you? Uh, you don't? We'll, we'll, deal, we'll deal with it. Let's see if we can. Any better at all? No, uh, not really. Uh, oh well, yeah. Because what if you put it behind you, it 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 uh, makes everything dark. But it's all right. We we can deal with it. You you actually look better in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You and I actually seem like we could have been. Man, we're like a, a long lost brothers or something. I know. I got to tell you, uh, Eli told me he goes, "You're gonna fall in love with this guy. He's got the right attitude." And uh, sure enough, it's true. Except you, except you. So my dad, when he passed away. He had a thick head of hair. He had a full head of hair. So this is from my mom's dad. <laughs> if, if you put me between my uncles, it's uh, thick on one side, nothing on the other, and we all look the same, and you're like, oh, yeah, these guys are related. And I'm just lucky I got the hair of the one uncle, not the other. So we talked a little bit about uh, – so I, well, I've been drinking the pot still th- th- through all this. We talked about the small batch. We talked about the single grain. We talked about the uh, the single malt. And talk about the uh, the so little. Let's, see, let's go back to the single malt real quick because okay. uh, this is something Alex Chasco takes a lot of pride in. And uh, Jack Teeling, when they said, "Hey, we're gonna, you know, we want to do a single malt," and Alex said, "You know, what do you guys want? What kind of?" And they said, "Make it the best." And Alex is all, "Make it the best." And after you know all these different tries and all these different formulas, thirty nine tries down the road, five different barrel types, and as Alex says. If you ever want to make a single malt, don't use five barrel types because you'll end up with Eric's hair line. There you know, go. It's, uh, it's just maddening because you think about it. Now you make it once. And here's something, you guys, is we don't put – we don't do 10, 12, 18 on most of our products. What we do is we put batch dates. So right. on the right. single malt that I have in front of me today, it's on April uh, 2019. So you'll see the batch date on the bottle itself. Okay. Okay. And so, so, uh, so small batch. Like, no, it's, it's a batch emphasis rather than an age emphasis. Yes. So in this in this single malt right now, it's nine to twenty three years of age. Okay. Right? So the twenty three that is a, a single malt's been aged in Olorosa sherry for its entire life, all twenty three years. The other is uh, bourbon, and then finished in. Madeira, Port, White Burgundy, and Napa Cap. So it's those five. Now, so we make this batch, and now we sell through, and we got to go make another batch. Well, maybe that White Burgundy that we wanted all the nose on it is kind of brought back. So now we have to look and go, oh, we need a barrel of this type to do it. So it's this puzzle every time to put it together. And uh, and the guys know whenever Alex is coming up to the warehouse to make a batch, they're like, oh, no, he's going to have us pull every barrel in the world down. and for us, a batch is 50 barrels or less. So I know our flagship whiskey is a tailing small batch, right? And with that small batch, this is our flagship. So the word small batch has no legal definition, right? right. right? And, you know, there's big vodka houses that call small batch that are not small batch. For us, it's 50 barrels or less, and we literally dump them into a trough empty them out and we all taste right there and taste the blend until we go, it's right. And then we say the batch is ready to go. Then we let it go sit in the tank for a while and then uh, bottle it down the road after that. Okay. So I got a little story to tell. Nice. So um, I'll, 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 I'm going to zoom me in for a second. So in my review, if you look at the thumbnail for this video, and I'm sure the distillery doesn't like my thumbnail. It says shit happens. And I'm sure when they saw that, they're like, what is this guy doing? What is he talking about? And here's the story. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to tell the story of what happened. I'm going to zoom in. So I'm going to tell a little story here. As okay. to, uh, 
what happened. Okay, so here's what happened to explain why it's called that shit happens. So b before I do my review, I like to take bottle shots and photo shots to sort of give a preview of what I'm going to be doing on my channel. So mo all the bottles have these uh, tubes or boxes with the exception of the small batch. So here's what here's here's what here's how you have a brain fart uh, like I did. So I got the tubes out. I'm gonna take these pictures, right? And I'm gonna take the ball. I'm gonna take. Ooh, that's that was loud. And I'm gonna take the bottles out. You know, I'm not gonna take all the bottles out. So I take all the tubes out. Take all the bottles out. And I, I put all the bottles out. You know, and I line them up real pretty. I can't do that here. You know, I line them up real pretty. And I take my photo of it. I post it on fa all over Facebook. I put it in uh, in the community section of my YouTube. All right. So I take the photo. This gives a preview of what's coming up on my channel. Then I go, okay, now I'm going to put all the bottles back in the tubes and start with a small batch. And this is what I did. I took the uh, I took the small batch and I went like this. I put it in the single malt. And so next thing I know, I got everything back in the tubes and I'm holding the single malt uh, bottle. Where did I put it? I'm holding the thing about bottle, and now I'm not reading the label because I, I'm thinking in my head, this is the small batch, but I put the small batch in the single malt tube. So the next few days, without even reading the label, I think I'm drinking the small batch, right? You know, I'm like, wow, a $25 whiskey. Holy cow, this is awesome. This is amazing. This is, you know, about the single, uh, single malt about 50, 60 bucks. So I'm like, holy cow, this is great. I actually recorded the video, recorded the review. I was like, wow, 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 wow. It had been up for 20 hours, you know, almost 24 hours. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at the, I looked at my video. I'm like, wait a minute. That's not the small batch. I can't believe I did that. I did a whole video. It had 900 views on it. And meanwhile, the whole time, I wasn't drinking the single malt. I wasn't drinking the, the small batch. I was drinking the single malt. So I completely goofed it up because I basically did a shell game on myself and moving the browser around. So if you're ever wondering, if you ever see, see that video, I'm going to look for the thumbnail and wonder, what was all that about? What happened there? How did he goof it up? That's how I did. <laughs> and you can't take yourself, you know, <laughs> so you can't take yourself too seriously. Shit no. happens. You, you screw up. You make mistakes. Being a whiskey tuber, it, I mean, it builds, it builds a whiskey dick is still in the house. Editing, you, you get a video done, you get it done, and then you're getting ready to post it, and you go, oh, crud. I had a, I had another video. It didn't post. Oh, actually, it did post. Somehow I dropped the A out of ABV. So it said 46 BV, and I'd already uploaded it, but it hadn't posted yet. And I was like, and then I had to delete it and change it. and then, Anyway, so stuff happens. So if you ever see the thumbnail for the single for the single malt for Teeling, that's why that title is on there. And it, I was like, how, how did I screw that up? Man, how did I do that? Am I losing my mind, you know, in addition to my hair? And I – It comes down to just drinking good whiskey, right? That's also about – so that's why we don't do 10, 12, 18. That's why we want – you know, it's a Wednesday night and you're going to read a book and you only want one drink. Hey, pour that single malt, right? You know, Eric, you're coming over to my house on the weekend. I'm going to pull out that single pot, you know, because it's so uniquely Irish. Oh, we haven't even had a chance really to talk about that yet. That's uh, so our single pot, you guys, is the 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 reason it's the color blue on the package. That's the color of Dublin. That's Dublin blue. Uh, so if you see like the Dublin football team, that's what they're wearing. Um, and then they go with that. We do 50 50, 50 malted, 50 unmalted. And the reason for this unmalted barley is because the English were fighting the French and they were taxing liquor already and they wanted more money. So they started taxing the malt right. and the Irish said, no, 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 no we're not going to do that. So they started using unmalted barley, which is very hard to work with, by the way. Uh, but it gives this unbelievable spiciness to the whiskey. I mean, it is just a gorgeous spicy tone to it. It's aged in virgin, um, uh, oak, American oak barrels, bourbon barrels, and sherry. And so, you know, we want this to be something that people can go, oh, I can really relate to this, uh, you know, because it is so uniquely Irish as it comes whiskey-wise. And you still, 
Uh, I know some, get a little back here. I know some bourbon drinkers don't like malted whiskeys because they don't. There's a malt character that shows them in the background. I really, really like that. Um, for some people, you know, like Roy Aquavite, you know, he appreciates bourbon and stuff, but for him, whiskey is really malt. Um, and it, so even though it's a 50 50, that malt character still shows up on, on the background and it does have, I would say that sort of classic, it's not butter, like on popcorn or a buttery Chardonnay, but it's like, if you made a sauce with a butter or, or it's like, a, like a butter that's been sort of reduced to make a sauce or something like that. Uh, it reminds me, I get a lot of that character or the butteriness of a, um, of a crust on, on like an, an apple pie. I get oh, yeah. kind of character in there as well. Really, really, really nice. Really, really like this whiskey. So if anybody has any questions, I know. So one question that was brought up and we were talking about it before we went live. Uh, if I can find it in here. Dun, 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 dun. Um, here we go. It was bubble bath bourbon. <laughs> so, <laughs> speaking of exper uh, experimental, uh, when's that peated coming out? Oh, what a, thank you, uh, Bubble Bath Bourbon, for a wonderful segue. Yes, uh, Black Pits. Uh, I've got to try it. It's absolutely. I'm I'm so in love with it. I'm because uh, I used to work for Brook Lottie and you know Port Charlotte and Octomore. I love Peter whiskey just like Eric does. So I'm really excited about this uh, that's coming out. Uh, Eric's been invited to taste it on November 17th, and it'll arrive in the states for market uh, on the first week of January. Okay. Okay. And it'll be about sixty-four dollars a bottle. Okay. Okay. So, so one of the things with Teen Lean is we want to keep our whiskeys as affordable as possible so everybody tries them. You know, we feel the the best way to grow this brand is to let people just taste the liquid. You know, because when you taste it, you go, dang, I like it. And that's one of the things I like too, is you know, from small batch, single grain, single malt to single pot, out of one of those four, you're gonna fall in love with at least one of them. You know, or you're going to say, oh, I like this with this style or, you know, this summer I drink a lot of single grain with my beer when it was super hot here in Livermore and it's 100 degrees outside. Or, you know, the wintertime, Eric, we were talking earlier, that's the perfect time for something a little peaty. And I'm really looking forward to the black pit. Yeah. Really yeah so the black. So I'll be doing peated. So I'll be doing. So I'll be uh, wrapping up my Irish whiskey marathon at the end of November, just as we're going to December. I'll be doing at least a month of non Isla peated and then going into independent Islas. Um, so it'll really sort of dovetail uh, in, in terms of in, amongst a bunch of other peated and I'll be able to do side by sides and see how it compares to other peated whiskeys. But really, really looking forward to that. Uh, it's almost it, almost like you can put it on your Christmas list, except for it's just going to come right after Christmas. Yeah, um, exactly. Now, so do we know what the production level is going to be like and whether or not we're going to get about 150 cases here in California. Ooh. So very small, uh, you know, for, and it's going to go across the country. Uh, so, um, you know, overall across the country, I think it's like 700 cases total. Okay. It's a very small amount. Um, the package is a little bit different. It's aged. It's a, a single malt and bourbon and then finished in Sautern casts. And, okay. uh, and it's about 15 parts per million P. And that peat just bounces out that Sauterne cast so beautifully. It's amazing. So you're going to get tons of fruit flavor as well as that beautiful smoke. Now, it's not the Ardbeg or Lagavulin or Lafroy kind of smoke. Um, the, it's more of a barbecue smoke that you'll see coming through. Okay. So Ben, uh, this is a comment that was made a while back. He says, is Teeling going to bring more unique finished whiskey into the U.S.? I see so many cool finished aged uh, stated bottles for sale in Europe. Only seen the 16 Calvados finish in, I think it said Pennsylvania. Yep. So we will, you know, we're small. We're not that big yet. You know, remember we just uh, uh, started in 2012, you know, first whiskey out in 15. We're growing a little bit as we can at a time. That's where the Black Pits is coming. You know, we came out with the first Dublin whiskey with the single pot. You know, the single pot's just absolutely gorgeous but you're going to see fun things coming out every year uh moving forward you know how fast we can do it i'm not sure uh but you know that's part of that you know 100 different types of barrels that are laid down in in ireland uh that you know things will come out you know we did an aqua v um you know uh, we did a ginger beer barrel uh so there's kind of fun ones off of that interesting, interesting. 
So um, if anybody else has any questions, let me know. Uh, um, we've been on for just a little bit over an hour. I kind of like to keep it tight, keep it an hour, do a little bit better on, on, on the replay. So um, let's see. Um, what do you think is like, so we have this peated one that's coming out. Do you know of anything else that might be coming out in the future? Or is there many talking about any other plans of what they might sort of venture into? So in California, in California, we're experimenting right now. We, uh, Total Wine, Bebmo, and Costco, they're doing barrel picks. So we're oh. going to have cognac and uh, some rum casts and some other finishes going to those. Uh, being new, you know, we went to the big guys you know, right off the bat that at least could take it all at one shot, and they did. Um, and the, those are rolling out right now. So if you're in California, you can get those barrel picks right away, um, Adam. And then um, – So one of the uh, – did you say it was Calvados? No, uh, Cognac. Cognac, okay. Yeah, Calvados is the one that we put out earlier. That was um, – there was a Calvados one out earlier before. So I'll definitely keep my eyes open. I definitely want to grab one of those. That'd be cool. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. So yeah, those things will come out with time, you know, and uh, as we grow and get bigger and we can, you know, handle more of these things, we'll, we'll do more of it. All right. So hey, I want to wrap it up. I want to thank everyone who uh, I got, had 21 uh, watchers here. All right, thank you for, th thank you very much, uh, Frank, for coming on, giving us this virtual tour. Uh, looking forward to getting over there and doing actual hands-on or feats on tour, a tour of the distillery. I, I man, it's like, you know, there's so much cred you go through and everything. Is, it just builds up more and more anticipation. One of these days, one of these days, I'm going to get on that plane and I'm going to go to Ireland, enjoy the sunny weather on the <laughs> <laughs> and do a tour. You're on your jumper when you're there. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, all right. Hey, hey um, if, you're, if anybody watching this hasn't already, give this video a thumbs up. Uh, share it with friends if you're watching on the replay. And um, any other comments or questions, if you're watching on the replay, leave them in a the comment down below, and I can forward them on to Frank. We'll keep in contact with Frank. And if you have any comments or any questions, anything like that, let me know, and I'll pass them on to Frank, and I will give a response. I reply as much as I can to every comment and question that comes across in the bottom of my channel. So, all righty. Hope everybody has a great uh, time for the rest of the weekend. Uh, Frank, hang in there, and we'll chat a little bit afterwards. And uh, let's see here. Let's go out with uh, uh, dun, 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 a little bit of my, my outro and rock and roll. All right. Sanjiva. Sanjiva.